Namaste. Welcome to the webinar today. My name is Ananda. I'm head of corporate communications and public affairs for East West Seed India. Thank you for joining us, uh, joining here with us. Today is the second of the sixth uh, six, uh, uh, series of webinars that we are conducting in association with FIKI and the Embassy of Netherlands. So the uh, webinar is titled as Get to Equal Women in Agriculture. We have a very distinguished panel today and thank you very much to the speakers who have uh, taken time off their busy schedules to join us, join with us today. And thanks to all of you viewers for joining us here. And our sincere thanks also to Fiki and the Embassy of Netherlands to make this uh, webinar reality. I now invite uh, Ms. Mikey Group, who is from the Public Affairs East West in India, to please open the session. She's also the daughter of Dr. Simon Groot, who's the founder of East West Seed International and also the 2019 World Food Prize Laureate. Over to you, Maike. Thank you, Ananda. It is a big honor to be part of this webinar on getting to equal, equal a mission close to my heart. Uh, when my father, Simon Groot, founded East West Seed 40 years ago, his mission was to improve the, um, uh, the income of smallholder farmers in the tropics with quality seeds and knowledge training on how to grow vegetables. Because improving the productivity of smallholders fights poverty amongst farmers and fights hunger amongst consumers. And so he did, reaching up to 20 million smallholder farmers who in their turn feed um, about 200 million consumers. My father's mission is still at the core of East West Seed. But over those 40 years, we also came to realize that many of those farms are women. And from FAO figures, we also know that on average, women run farms produce about 20 to 30% less than farms run by men. And the reasons for this crop gap have nothing to do with an aptitude for farming, but everything to do with gender specific obstacles. In developing countries, Cultural norms often prevent smallholder farm, women farms from borrowing money. And without adequate funds for investments, female farmers are less likely to be able to purchase um, inputs like quality seeds, fertilizer, um, or even use uh, more sustainable practices. This is a big hampering in their increasing their crop yields. And this is not only one thing, there's also the other issues like land rights, lack of infrastructure, safety, um, Women may not even have permission to leave their village to sell vegetables off at the market. Now, we want to celebrate our 40th year anniversary by launching a study. We want to find out what the specific constraints are for women in vegetable production. And we want to use those findings to improve our own practices so women farmers can also grow their productivity and income. Because you know the saying, if you teach a man to farm, his family will eat. And if you teach a woman to farm, the community will eat. Will you please launch the video, Ananda, to share a little more about this study? Hello, wake up there. Are you ready to party? It's our 40 year anniversary and our birthday wish is to drive sustainable change by serving farmers better every day. Did you know that targeted investment to female farmers can boost farm production and feed 100 to 150 million more people globally? It's impressive, right? We are wondering what is it that we could do to help these farmers and boost production of healthy veggies. Our assumption is by supporting women to get better access to knowledge and quality inputs would increase their participation in decision making, resulting in sustainable adoption of improved vegetable techniques leading to higher yields. As this is hypothetic goals, it calls for a study. So that is what we are going to do. To be able to find concrete strategies which help us further improve vegetable production. The study will be very practical in nature and less focused on achieving academic results. Via focused group discussions and interviews, 
we will explore ways to empower female farmers and address their challenges in vegetable production, as well as review decision-making about crop protection, or as the insiders call it, women as IBM leaders. This study is not something we can do alone. We will work closely with experts from Rural, Grow Asia, World Village, and CG like AR. But most importantly, we are going to join forces with the women themselves because they are the real experts, aren't they? This study will be conducted in the Philippines, India, Tanzania, and Uganda to start with. As we speak, we have already started with designing the study. In October, we will present our first results and hope to spark the interest for further academic research on women as key entrepreneurs in vegetable farming. Isn't this exciting? Are you curious about our journey? Do you have ideas for follow-up research? Let us know. Thank you, Mikey. And now I'd like to present to all of you brief profiles of our distinguished panel today. It's my honor to present to you the profiles of the panel today. So I'll start with Dr. Mary Ann Sayok, who is our moderator for today's session. Dr. Mary Ann Sayok is the public affairs lead of East West Seed International. She has 20 years of professional experience in the seed industry. She was former general manager of East West Seed Philippines, a market leader for tropical vegetable seeds in Asia and developing markets in Africa and Latin America. Prior to her stint in the private sector, Dr. Mary Ann had a long career with the government. She held key positions in the Department of Agriculture as regional director and executive director of the Agricultural Training Institute. Uh, we are also very fortunate to have Dr. Jacqueline Hughes. Uh, she is currently the Director General of the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, ECRISAT, Hyderabad, India. A virologist by training, she has worked in the United Kingdom and Ghana before moving to the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, Nigeria, then moving to become the Deputy Director General for Research at the World Vegetable Center World Veg in Taiwan, and later the Deputy Director General for Research at the International Rice Research Institute, IRI, the Philippines. She has an extensive publications record and strong interests in plant health, epidemiology, gender equity, nutrition, and remote sensing digital agriculture. Dr. Hughes is a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology. Thank you, Dr. Sudha Mysore, for joining here with us today. She is currently the CEO of Agri Innovate India Limited, a government of India company established under DARE ICAR, associated with the tech transfer, commercialization, and startup support through the National Agricultural Research Education System. Prior to this, she was a principal scientist at the ICAR, Indian Institute of Horticultural Research, Bangalore, with 33 years of work experience experience in ICAR. Dr. Sudha Mysore, double uh, Fulbright Fellow, having won pre-doctoral and post-doctoral fellowships with rich working experience at the Cornell University and Michigan State University. Her research experience is uh, and efforts include economic analysis and impact assessment research. Coming to Dr. Rajul Patkar, who is the co-founder for Proximal Soil Sense Technologies, Dr. Rajul Patkar is the co-founder and the chief executive of Proximal Soil Sense Technologies. She is a principal investigator for many government-funded government projects like BIRAC, Atal Niti Aayog, and Nidhi Prayas, et cetera. However, she likes to describe herself as an entrepreneur, a mother inspiring her daughter, a business leader inspiring her team, um, a, prof a professor inspiring young minds and an agri-scientist inspiring farmers. She's an engineer by profession, specializing in sensors and embedded technologies. As a research scientist at IIT Bombay, she, along with her associates, started Proximal Soil Sense with a vision to make it a higher purpose agri-tech company delivering disruptively innovative, patented, customized, and affordable technology-enabled solutions that make real-time data capture seamless and very cost-effective. Her company offers solutions that are simple, easy to use and very cost effective for smallholder farmers. So that's the panel today. So 
Over to uh, Dr. Mary Ann, please take over the discussion. Thank you, uh, Ananda. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our panel discussion. I am honored to share the stage with our distinguished panel of accomplished women. In a male-dominated field like agriculture, this is a welcome sight as women are often perceived as having supporting roles only. Globally, women comprise 43% of the agricultural labor force. In India, nearly 75 to 80% of the full-time workers on Indian farms are women. They are the invisible workforce and yet are central to India's agricultural economy. But we will not only be talking here about women farmers, but also about women entrepreneurs, women scientists and engineers who play important roles in ensuring food and nutrition security. It is often said that if women farmers had the same access to resources as men, the number of hungry in the world could be reduced by up to 150 million. Women play such an important role and yet they get very little recognition. There are also less women in leadership positions as, as traditionally executive roles are meant for men. We will have a look at the obstacles or barriers to advancement that women often face in the light of the multiple roles they play as primary caregiver, homemaker, teacher to their children, and other family responsibilities. We will hear from our distinguished panel their personal journeys to get to where they are now, how they have overcome gender bias, and what kind of support they have received from their families and organizations. So let's start with some brief opening statements from our panel. Dr. Jackie Hughes, you have the virtual floor. Thank you, Marianne. And thank you to everyone for joining this particular discussion. Um, in trying to think of what my personal journey has been, it's been quite a long one. Um, I am British, but I grew up in the Seychelles, in Malaysia. I've worked in the UK, in Ghana, Nigeria, Taiwan, Philippines, India. I've worked with East West Seeds. But interestingly, why did I start working in agriculture, which was very male dominated, even when I was thinking about it? And that comes down to my parents, very supportive parents. My mother was a microbiologist. She supported my father because she was a lecturer at Imperial College so that he could go to Trinidad to study tropical agriculture. And I think the key thing that my family taught me was learn, keep learning, and be broadly, um, broadly informed. So I went to a local school. There was an international school, but my parents said, no, go to a local school, learn with your friends. So, this very diverse background, diverse faiths, learn. And then I learned about motorcycles and cars and getting my hands oily. I learned about cooking and sewing. I learned about plantation agriculture, about boats, about helicopters. My parents believed that women and men, because my brother was there, should learn about everything together. There was, there was some gender stuff going on, but in general, you can do everything. Don't say, no, oh, I, can't, I can't take a car engine apart. Of course you can. You might not be strong enough. Ask someone to do that bit and carry on. Also, um, you need to, what I found was in this male dominated world, you need resilience and sometimes some nasty things happen to you as a person that helps build resilience 
I don't wish that on anyone, but when it happens, learn from it and move on. As I went through postdocs, very short postdocs, because I wanted to get out of the UK, which was a bit chilly, um, confidence became super important. Self-confidence, but not in your face. So before I went to Ghana, I was very lucky to go on a, um, I think they called it an acclimatization training in Ghana. And they got some very senior Ghanaians there and they said, right, Jackie, you're going into the middle of Ghana, working with a national program. Convince this guy to do something he does not want to do. And they gave me an example. And I convinced the person to the extent they said, stop, 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 stop trying to persuade me. I'll do it. I'll do it. And that was a very senior Ghanaian. So that set me up for that first job. Um, I have to say that I've had some wonderful mentors and they've all been men. I haven't had the, the luck to have a woman mentor, but the men were fine too. Um, they were, initially they were very, Oh, excuse me, guys, very traditional men, and I had my place, but they worked so hard to let me do what I wanted to do, what I needed to do. Um, as I grew in, through, up, um, I found that senior women have a really different style, uh, often quieter. I also agree with that saying is, if you want something doing urgently, find the busiest woman and it will get done immediately. Um, women don't, I find, don't usually need to brag. Um, in my role right now, they say, huh, Ikrisat is running super well, but the leadership is quiet, gets things done, and suddenly there's a big event and everyone goes, wow. We do all the PR stuff around the edges, but for me personally, it's a bit quieter. And some of my colleagues find it a little bit disconcerting because they don't, oh, in meetings, I'm actually the only woman in the leadership team and I have all the men sitting around and they find the quiet style quite challenging. And the only other thing I would say that I've learned, you need good humor. You have to laugh at yourself and laugh at them. And we all laugh together and we realize the differences between us are so, the synergies by accepting the differences has made all the difference to me. And that's where I'm coming from as the Director General of ICRISAT, going through all of that. And this is the pinnacle of where I want to be. And all of you will know that sometimes working in India with the Indian men can be interesting at times, um, but it's a fun challenge because they're human too and a grin and it works. So that's where I'm coming from, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie, for sharing with us your inspiring journey. Um, we will now uh, hear from uh, Dr. Suda Mysore. You have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Marianne. Thank you so much for making me part of this wonderful debate or uh, this webinar. Uh, I'm from a very middle-class service-oriented family where my mother was a housewife and uh, brought up with a lot of stereotyping of women and stereotyping typical Indian uh, middle-class family. That's where I am from. 
But one thing they taught my mother and my parents taught me was to be very studious and uh, passion for studies. That's what they imbibed into me. And I remember my, we are two sisters and we don't have brothers. So there used to be a little bit of a stigma sometimes like, oh, there are no boys in the house kind of thing. But my mother taught us that one thing very important is to be independent. So you have to study, you have to make yourself independent and do your job. And independence was what was imbibed into us as children. So probably because of that, I was a very studious student and I did very well. And I joined service uh, at the agricultural research service. And of course, uh, I mean, it was very difficult initially because there are a lot of biases were there. But I would say like, uh, like the, always they used to say like, uh, you're a woman, what can you do? Especially in agriculture, where are you? You can't travel, you can't do, go to the fields and do things. But somehow that didn't stop me from doing what I want to do because I am an economist by profession. And one thing we have to do is interact with people and get the data, collect data and analyze it. So that made me travel extensively within the country and learn a lot about all these agriculture systems and things. And one thing I would say is that perseverance helped me come over all these obstacles. And one thing was also was that although equals may be at your own level, people are discriminating at times, but somehow the seniors were very good. They recognized uh, the fact that I could articulate better, I could do things better and probably I'm much more sincere than many others that gave me a lot of opportunities and I grew within the organization. And I would say that the Indian Council of Agriculture Research has given me everything to grow into a very refined person that I am today. And I became a principal scientist and especially at the moment I am the CEO of AgriNovit, which is a technology uh, commercializing unit of ICAR. It's a company owned by ICAR. And I am running that company. And it's a very interesting journey because when I took over uh, three years ago, the company uh, was almost in the verge of shutting down. So I took over and I just turned it around. And today it's considered as one of the platforms where all technologies from ICR institutes, about 110 of those are likely to be translated. Technology commercialization happens through us. So I think it's a great achievement and all of us feel very good that the system we are able to keep it going. Now coming to my experiences, if I have to say, uh, like I have interacted with several women, agri-farmers at various levels. And even in agricultural research service, I think we are in India, more than 6,000 scientists are there in, in the agricultural research service itself, but at least 30 to 40% of them are women. And in the last decade, what we've seen is that more than at least 10 of them are reached the position of director of an institute or at a really high level where decisions are going to be taken. So in that aspect, I feel that many of my colleagues are doing extremely well and we are giving very tough competition to the men. And uh, of course there are biases and as Jacqueline very rightly put it, we Indian men are a bit difficult at times to deal with. But as you rightly said, ma'am, you have to have a sense of humor. You should have make them feel very comfortable, make them feel like they are the bosses and then get whatever you want to. That's what has been a, a learning lesson for me. And uh, I feel especially the farming community, uh, really, they, I mean, I've come across so many women farmers, so many people who really run their families. But uh, one thing I think most as a woman, what they say is that I have to, the family's happiness is before anything else. So if the family has to be together, it has to have, be happy. I think I have to adjust, I have to sacrifice. So that's what most of the women in India at least adopt. I'm sure this is what the world over, this is what system is. And that's how women farm women just adjust and go forward. I know it is, they are not discriminated. They don't have access to inputs and so many constraints are there. But one thing that makes them go 
forward is to take their families together. Being a technology person, I have dealt with a lot of technologies which are women-oriented technologies. Sometimes the whole family is taking care of it. But especially flower cultivation, there was uh, some uh, tuberose cultivation. I, I did an extensive study. And most of the women tell me that today my children go to school, my kitchen is running, my, my house is running because of this particular flower cultivation because it gives a steady income that makes it run. So th this is small things which I thought I will share with you, but I've been very fortunate, like all of us have to having a very understanding partner and a lovely daughter and a family who's really supporting, even if I have to be staying away or doing whatever I wanted to do, my parents totally supported me and that's how I am here. Thank you so much. At this stage, I would like to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mysore. Uh, also very interesting journey. And I like what you said that uh, the Indian women are now giving men a strong competition. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, of course, uh, we would like to hear from uh, Dr. Rajul Patkar. You have the floor. You're on mute, the doctor. Okay, sorry, sorry about it. So I was saying thanks, Amanda, for the introduction, a very nice introduction, and thanks to Dr. Marian for giving me this opportunity here to talk about uh, my journey. And uh, uh, as an agri entrepreneur, as a woman in STEM, and uh, how I overcome the challenges. So here I'm just putting a picture. It's early 70s. The girl in the extreme right with the short hair is me sitting there and with my cousin in the center. So I come from a very traditional community. I did not feel, feel any gender bias as per the family, but the gender bias was prevalent in the society. So, but because of that, I consciously or unconsciously, I was always competing with my cousin who was in the center. And I would like, from the dress to the food to everywhere I will be competing with him. Maybe because I used to see maybe a gender bias uh, in the society. So here you can see that both of us are wearing the similar shirt that was called a Rajesh Khanna shirt from Hathi Mere Hathi movie. I think you may not know about that Hindi movie, but that was a movie and very famous actor. So both of us wearing the same dress, same type of shirt. So that is about me. And that kind of, I mean, uh, I would say the, uh, my spirit or my things continue. So when I finished my 10th standard, 10th grade, I, I my 10th from a small town in Andhra, and there was no uh, technical education uh, in my town. And uh, most of the women there, like after 10th, were doing the commerce, uh, going to a women's college and doing commerce and then married. But I, that was something I did not want. And again, as you, I always say that I was competing with the, my, I mean, the classmates are in the boys are uh, males in my class or something. They were going for technical education outside the town, staying in the hostel. So after 10, I was the only girl from my colony, you can, or from my campus, who went to the hostel, pursued technical education. So I did my diploma from a uh, place for Kakinada and then my engineering. And then for my master's, I came to Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Bombay. I did my master's and uh, things were going great. And as in India, I mean, at a certain age, you are either like really in the start looking for, your parents start looking for your match or marriage and things of that sort. And then I got married and even though people in the family are good, everybody is good, but then in India, as uh, Dr. Sudha and both Dr. Jacqueline said that, uh, I mean, it's a patriarchal society. So, and the media, the community, the societies expects women to be like a superwoman. They need to take care of the family. That becomes parity. And uh, the media, uh, the woman who keeps herself I mean, away, I mean, her happiness as a secondary and everything else as a primary is considered as a good woman. 
and if you i um, mean think about yourself or your career or your ambitions you are called as a not so good or maybe a bad woman so because of this and that kind of patriarchal society after my marriage even though i was a master from iit bombay my career graph kind of leveled and then at the age of 45 when my daughter was old when she was the one who pushed me and my mother who motivated me at 45 i registered for my phd and at 50 i completed my phd and went for entrepreneurship so that's my story about uh, uh, my entrepreneurship journey how i overcome those challenges and see unless we we decide for ourselves it is okay to be considered bad but until unless you are happy you can't keep your family happy and if you really pursue i mean it is finally i think reforms can come uh, policies can change but until unless you change your mindset nothing is going to change so the women are the one who have to change first their mindset and say that it is okay to be pursue it is okay to be selfish it is okay to pursue your dreams there is nothing wrong in that and that is my story so when i build up when i co founded this agriculture company so i am an engineer by profession i wanted to build technologies which can be equally adopted by both men and women it should not be that the technologies that are built can be used so you can see in my slides also there's a man and a woman holding the soil and equipment and we want to build technologies where we can empower women we know the limitations as a woman i know the limitations of an indian woman so if we can build a technologies where we can take care of the family but at the same time use these technologies and help other farmers she will i mean it will really help the whole community so our technologies are very simple to use very easy to use very affordable and everybody is talking about data analytics and then this will build as affordable technologies to acquire the data so these are the technologies such as soil sense we have built and i called our systems as plant health diagnostic systems phd systems so all the farmers will be phd and the doctors they will be their own farm doctors they will be own their doctors so this is what i like to call the soil technologies and uh, we want so you can see a woman holding we want to we work with women we work with self help groups we train them uh, i think rural women are very strong they live up they have a good purpose uh, only thing is that because of the discrimination which because of the patriarchal society because of not having enough resources not having a proper training they 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 actually uh, i mean that's the reason they lose on the opportunity so we focus on training them we focus on uh, uh skill and skill development i'm also working with win foundation where win with with the support of win foundation we want to actually also help girls who are getting dropped out of the school and train them on this technologies these are very simple technologies which can be re- easily get trained we have presented that in yesterday in uh, the pune in kisan mela and we could actually ma- uh, train one woman who came to the stall to operate uh, our technology so they are so simple and uh, that is my journey and that is what soil sense is trying to do and thank you for this opportunity thank you uh, dr raju for also a very interesting uh, journey from uh, uh, being a uh, uh, an engineer no also and an entrepreneur so uh, thank you to all our panelists so let me ask uh, um, some specific questions no uh, dr jackie jackie as i'd like to call uh, jack as a recognized leader in international agricultural research and management and being the only female dg in the cgiar system how would you assess the role of uh, women in the field of research thanks mariana I, i think you've said it all because as of today i am the only one female director general out of 15 um and i was going to say the role of women in research i think starts from within our own research institutions because from the data i could find on 74 icar icar institutes there were back then only three women directors of the 74 which is one in 24 which is 
not very good. And then I was looking up some more information and I found a study conducted by Socioeconomic Studies and Services funded by Niti Ayok. And they were looking at career attainment and fulfillment of family and household responsibilities. And they talked to almost a thousand working female science professionals, half as many students. What I found was a little weird and I didn't like it was one of the questions was, what is the perception about the effect of your career on family commitments and household responsibilities? So you've already twisted the question in a way that is, I don't know the right word, maybe patronizing, I, I don't know. Um, and at least a third said, their career adversely affected their family commitments. And the point I want to make is that those were the ones that were still in their jobs, not the ones who had left because of that dual role, the career and the family. They have a day job and a second unpaid job of family responsibilities, which from my experience seems to be the bigger part of their lives. And then I was thinking about when girls try and get into STEM education, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics, there's the gender stereotypes, like the STEM fields are masculine. Within many of those areas, the men that are there, it's so dominating, it's inflexible, it's exclusionary, and that perpetuates because it's not supportive or attractive to women. Role models, I was lucky to have male role models, but not many female ones. And sometimes the teachers, the teacher that taught me math was probably not very comfortable with it herself because she'd been told it was a boy's role. So it's affecting everything we do. It affects the research we do. I sometimes think that women are invisible in this world designed for men. And it affects how we do our research. When we ask men about uh, what new variety they want, they only look at yield and the price they're going to get. And the women are looking at land prep, weeding, cooking, looking at everything. Uh, there's an unspoken assumption that big machinery is going to be driven by men. Training sessions are for women. Why would you arrange it when they've got to take kids to school, feed them, do the laundry, or you put childcare there so they can attend? And then finally, when you get into the cutting edge research, there was a report in March 2021, that just 25% of news sources and subjects were women. And that was already a lot better than 95 when it was 17, 17, 17% women. And another study, which I found a little bit uncomfortable, was of the direct quotes in Nature's journalistic articles, almost 70% were from men, which is better than 2005 when it was 87%. So these are also important reminders that there's not only gender bias in the workplace and in the home, but in science publishing too, which affects research and delivery of outputs. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jackie. So even in uh, research, there's still, uh, you know, less women. Huh? Okay. Um, for Dr. Suda, uh, my sore, as a past principal scientist at uh, ICAR and now CEO at AgriInnovate India, a government enterprise, can you tell us more about the status of uh, women scientists in the public sector? Yeah, uh, as I said, public sector undertakings, women are there everywhere. Actually, like in my own organization, or if you look at any organization, more than 30 to 40% uh, 
uh, scientific community is women, but the others like the technicals or research associates or all, most of them are women. And they are, uh, there is not that kind of a discriminatory kind of a thing that a woman cannot take up a particular science or something like that. But as Jacqueline very rightly pointed out, yes, there is a, a subtle difference that is like women will have to do double the work as a man would do. Because a man would probably be only concentrating on his research. But a woman has to concentrate on her research, make sure that it is presented very well, at the same time has to be very humble and also take care of her family and also be good, quiet and good. And that kind of a double uh, edgedness is always there. And what I find is even if a woman is doing exceedingly well, the acceptance of her work as the best or acceptance as uh, uh, she is the best comes very, very, with a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, kind of a subtly it comes, but not openly, they will not be able to praise or appreciate it. The another thing I noticed very strange is that citations, research citations, if you see, uh, I have, this is my personal understanding, is if a man cites something or men, men's research papers are cited much more than a woman researcher's papers. I don't understand why it is but somewhere down the lane, they feel that a woman should restrict her kind of studies to more uh, nutritional aspects or supporting women and not actually into cutting edge technologies. So there is always a subtle difference. I notice that it is there even in the researchers which they're not going up with great pinch of salt that I think now slightly the situation is better like as Jacqueline was you know, very rightly giving some figures, but I may not be able to give you figures, but it is very true that it is very subtle, but the change is there. But as Rajul put it, we'll have to prove for ourselves. We'll have to break our own barriers and come out and say like, yes, I can do it and I will be there. So only that kind of a confidence that gives you to push ahead and many women researchers I'm seeing are really passionate and doing so wonderfully well today, at least in agriculture. Thank you, uh, Dr. Suda, for sharing those insights with us. Uh, for uh, Dr. Rajul, you are an entrepreneur having co-founded a company providing state-of-the-art tools like sensors and IoT platforms to farmers. Can you tell us more about well, what inspired you to venture into this and how did these tools help farmers, men and women alike, become more productive? Okay, so uh, frankly speaking, uh, I always believed in doing some kind of a application-based research. As I said that I was kind of a rebel from the very beginning, I moved to and did the technical education. So even while during masters, we were training some teachers and we realized that this technology is definitely available but are not uh, affordable for Indian uh, colleges, even if this was early 90s and 92s. So I built up technologies uh, which was very similar to what was available in USA, but at a very affordable so that the in teachers in the college can, I am talking about some BLSI kits and uh, ethic and skilled programmable data kits. So at 45, when I, I uh, from my master's to PhD, it is not that I was not working. I was working like Cinderella. So when my school, uh, my kid was going to the school and that is the time I was actually going to the office and trying to work on whatever opportunities, whatever projects I was getting into. Because it was, it was my dream was to become, go to a corporate and work and earn because I've seen my parents really struggling with my sister being disabled and all that kind of situation. So uh, during that time, it was like a kind of a Cinderella, a Cinderella working child. But at 45, when my daughter was old enough, I worked and I used to read a lot about farmers in agriculture, farmer suicide, technologies. I visited IA before I started working into this agriculture domain. And I met a lot of scientists there. 
and then we we saw that they showed us some systems which IRI is the best institute in India for agriculture. They could procure the institute, but uh, I mean, if if there is anything problem with the uh, system, the service support was not so great. I said if if uh, IRI is facing problem in uh, having the technology service, what are the farmers? I mean, it's just impossible for them to adopt technology. And that's where I was the first student at IIT Bombay who took up agriculture development of sensors. And uh, the reason we took it is that was farmers, we, build, we need to build technologies. Maybe we have to customize technologies. It's not that we are building everything from scratch like a rocket science. There are technologies available in Netherlands, in USA, in Israel. So, but we need to customize them. So that was the motivation to get into agri. And the motivation was to build technology for small farmers. So if I can build something for small farmers, which they definitely can be adopted by horticulture. But if I build something for horticulture farmers, they cannot be adopted by a, a small farmer. So that was the motivation. That is why we took up hard. I mean, I would say sensors is the heart of the system. So if you have a sensors, it takes a lot more time to develop them. So we started to look at the hard problems and did not look at the commercialization or a business. We first wanted to build something and then commercialize. So that is why we took so much of time in building technologies. And now we are into startups. And as I said, that our aim was to build technologies for small farmers, women. I have faced my own challenges. So all our technologies are very simple, very easy to use, very lightweight, uh, can be adopted by uh, women farmers, self-help groups. So this was the motivation, and that's why we build the technologies the way we have built, up, built it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajul. The, there's a question in the chat box, which I think is uh, uh, addressed to you. With the intervention of uh, modern agricultural implements and women force from farm mm -hmm. sector yeah. also moving towards IT, what would be your view on participation of women in agricultural operations in rural India? Yeah, so here are, there are multiple and I mean uh, ways of looking at this question. If the question talks about the IT sector and the rural women and agri. So I would tell you that the power, I mean, I would say some private institutions, some research found, uh, some foundations, um, there are many people who are now trying to uh, uh, educate rural women, the rural girls for, in, into learning coding. So there are many organizations who are looking at uh, ICT, they call it uh, communication and technology. So they are training. Uh, so these this girls can actually then uh, do the soft development kind of a work. But unfortunately, um, I, uh, I would like to differ with Dr. Sudha here. Uh, she has, because in agricultural institutes, there are many women and in science, many women scientists. I happen to be one of the uh, government government uh, technical institute, uh, intro kind of an institute. And there I could see women only as on receptionist table or some in the clerical. I did not see a single woman scientist in a team. And that was very, very alarming to me. And I actually spoke to the director in a very kind of a very uh, straight about things I don't mean uh, means with words. So I just went and asked the director because I was at part of a group and I could take that liberty and ask. I said, why there are no women? It's not that the woman doesn't understand the clean room or cannot work. It was, but there is a bias here in the government institute. They don't want to hire. It is undercurrent. They don't want to hire because they will go on maternity leave. Then they might have some other problem. They might take sick leave. If the, if so, that's why it is the, so those changes have to happen. Uh, IT is fine. Even if you sort of Indian companies, you will see a lot of women co-founders doing e-commerce kind of a startup or maybe a, a software startup, but you won't find anywhere anybody doing this hardware sensors or IoT kind of a startup. That's a very challenging kind of a work.
but yeah, yeah all this technologies and women farmers definitely slowly things are changing but as i said uh women have to change themselves nobody is going to give them a baton to like run the relation uh, they have to take up i mean I, they have to stand up for themselves and then if they stand up for themselves nothing can change so i think for this gender to, to like uh, reduce the gender parity or something a revolution has to happen it cannot happen with reforms now and revolution can only happen when you change the mindset of the people mindset of people yeah yeah thank you uh, dr rajul dr sudha would you want to add to that uh, i i i'm not sure which institute you visited but i am seeing in the last 10 years i see i come across with girl students everywhere any college you go to or any institute you go to there are various positions all research positions i i can't differentiate you know there are equal number of women doing extremely well in fact this morning also i was there in one conference uh, for in, in institute industry interface meeting and i found uh, equal number of women are there and who are also taking part maybe like jacqueline said like maybe not at the top level maybe they may not be become ceos or become director generals but women are there everywhere uh, and i don't see that difference at all especially even if you go to an agriculture college nowadays you see 50 per, more than 70% are women who are doing extremely well and they really do well in studies also but of course they'll have to fight and they'll have to fight for themselves and put themselves in the race but women are there everywhere that's what my observation is yeah so thank you dr suda uh well you talked about uh some of the um the barriers not to to advancement of women then how do you now this is a question for for all three of you how do we empower women to enable them to take up more important roles in in agriculture um Cha I, yes go ahead yeah, okay yeah jacqueline please please okay thank you how do we empower women you know sometimes i also think it's how do we empower men to think about women properly <clears throat> what well, for the women who are listening <laughs> be confident in what you know that i think is important and encourage other people to be confident and be yourself don't try and be the man you think you should be be yourself and at ecrisat we make sure that no one including yourself is recruited into a position because of his her or their gender you're recruited because you're the best to do all that you need the right policies and programs whether it's institutional or broadly and diversity is important be different and revel in it and i just want to share one story about empowerment a very small one and it was an american female scientist maybe in her 40s felt belittled by an asian senior scientist and i think the ladies here probably have felt that themselves but knowing them both and i could guess what part of the problem could be i asked the woman what the scientist called her what the man called her and it was her first name so jackie i said what do you call him ah Doctor, Doctor Smith. Why do you call him Doctor Smith when he's calling you Jackie? Well, I said try call him by his first name. Can't do that. It's not respectful. Well, he's not respecting you, so payback time. She called him by his first name. On the first day, the dynamics changed. positively after a little bit of what have you just called me and it was a tiny change that she couldn't see she put herself in that position and he probably didn't help it small change huge difference that's 
part of what I think empowerment is. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jackie. Uh, Dr. Suda? Uh, I, I just was thinking a lot about how do we empower women. And what came to my mind is a lot of peas. I, I thought I could give a PQ is what I call it. At, uh, at, uh, at the various levels, we need to have these things. One is at a state level, like you need to have a policy which gives due credit to women and the policy should be in place. Second one is public awareness has to be created. That's the second P for me. And the third P is to practice. Unless you practice in the society and bring this awareness and uh, policy into practice, it doesn't work. Then at the, at the second level is to me is at a household level. Even at home, you need to have priority. There is a lot of priority has to be given to women and it should not be like said like, let the boy have the uh, thing and let them, you adjust. That should not be there. The priority should be there. And the parity should be there where both boy and the girl are treated equally. And of course, a lot of partnerships have to be built between brothers and sisters, husband, wife, mother, father. That's the second level, I think. And the third is at the individual level. Individual level, I feel, is that patience is the most important thing for a woman because it takes a lot of time for many people to understand you or value you. The second thing is a lot of prayers, of course. And the last one uh, to me is perseverance. You have to stick to your guns and say, this is what I want and this is what I want to achieve. So I put this as PQ and uh, various levels and that's what I think will help empowering women, especially women and anyone else. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Suda. Dr. Rajul, please. Yeah, also taking a uh, few from what Dr. Suda said, uh, PQ, and I would say perseverance. I think the women are born with it. I think uh, perseverance is the only thing I can say that women, every woman has that quality. Uh, they're quite powerful. Only thing is that uh, they need to understand their power and they have to set their priorities right. And I think reforms is one aspect of it. But I think it was a, this patriarchal and the gender bias is a deep rooted thing. So it has to be accelerated uh, and it cannot happen just with reforms. There has to be a revolution. And as I said, revolution can only come with change in mindset, mindset of the, uh, a woman by mindset of men. Men should be able to keep their ego aside and work as, in supporting role what they are doing it today. So if men can do a supporting role, women definitely can achieve and this can accelerate like anything. That, that the, I think there won't be any disparity or uh, bias anymore. Then that's my fine mm -hmm. thing I could say. Thank you, Dr. Raju. Um, Maike, would you like to say something or <laughs> share? <laughs> you have been oh. listening quite uh, yeah, intently. <laughs> yes, and I'm really excited to hear the stories of all these uh, uh, very inspiring women. Um, uh, not much to add, except that I think um, stand up for yourself. What I always hear is that uh, for new jobs or positions, uh, men tend to uh, jump for it, even if they don't tick all the required boxes and women tend to step back. They feel they are not 100% up to the task. So it's, it, that's also a matter of confidence. And then I firmly believe in sisterhood. What, what I will never forget are the, are the discussions that I have in the, in the countries where we work with women and sharing experiences on, on how we achieve and how do we manage to, uh, to balance uh, family, work, career, aspirations is, is also very helpful. I think this is right. a, a good step in that direction. Right, <laughs> Thank right. Thank you. So self-confidence and persistence, patience, perseverance, so all those qualities. So um, let me just, uh, we're, we're coming uh, to uh, almost to an end to, uh, of our panel. Let me just get maybe one or two sentences, parting statements from our panelists before I ask our 
uh, before I ask Rick Nobel to, to uh, give us a few words. Jackie, please. Thank you. So my last few words, it's important to understand and, and acknowledge that the rise of women, because we are, in particularly in this male bastion of ag research, does not imply the fall of men. And we're at a really interesting time where the world expects or expects diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the world notices its absence, celebrates its presence. So let us all be confident, be different, and be ourselves. Thank you, Jackie. Dr. Suda, please. Uh, I wish to uh, sum up and say that you be yourself, of course, that's the, that's the message. But don't be shy to fight. If you have to fight, you have to fight. And it doesn't matter what anyone thinks. But if you think that you're discriminated against, raise your voice and fight for it. I think Rajul also has put it, and that's a way forward, I feel. Is the, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sira. Dr. Rajul, please. I would say women don't stop if there are obstacles. I, I compare women like a, a, with a river, that river keeps flowing, whatever the obstacles, it finds a different way and starts flowing. So just don't bother with the obstacles and keep flowing. I think people will adjust. It is okay to be called bad. As long as you think that you are doing right, it is fine. That is yeah, uh, thank you very much. And I would really like to thank our esteemed panelists for sharing their insights and personal journeys. And I hope this will inspire other women and girls to pursue their dreams and aspirations to become women leaders themselves. So may I now ask uh, uh, the agricultural attache of the Embassy of the Netherlands in India, Mr. Rick Nobel, to say a few words, an empowered man, <laughs> Rick, please, thank you very you much. Call. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. First of all, I would also like to thank Ananda for setting up these uh, amazing webinars and uh, putting this very important topic in the slides. And I've been very inspired by, uh, by all the speakers. And uh, I think it's important for me uh, and a lot of men actually uh, listen. Uh, um, the embassy is committed uh, to uh, the sustainable development goals, but I think there's one SDG that should underpin all activities, and that's number five, gender equality. Um, and I recognize um, the image, the division of labor is very gendered. Often the farmer, when there's a family, the man is referred to as the farmer, even though it's it's a family affair. I recognize this from my childhood, growing up on a farm. Um, a sentence that, uh, a funny sentence that reminds me of how it actually was on the. We lost Rick. Okay, Rick, uh, he's trying to reconnect. Oh, yeah. Yes, Rick, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, can you hear me again? Yes. Yes, yes. so I was saying um, from my childhood experience, uh, uh, my father was seen as the farmer, but in reality it was like, uh, father can do everything, but mother does everything. My mother was the leading figure in the farm. And I think that's the case in a lot of farms. So I would here where the farmer referred to as the, the, the man um, and I would really like to see this change uh, in the future and be part of this when I look meetings uh, embassies um, uh, but also events uh, I see a lot of men in suits I am myself now a man in suits I think uh, talking role models uh, we should uh, empower and have those few uh, uh, role models and uh, decision makers, which is crucial. I suppose in the end, how do we empower uh, women? And I think 
uh, it was Dr. Hughes we, who turned it around. How do we make men realize this? And I think an important uh, part of that is just listen. That's what I did for an hour, and it has been very inspiring. So I want to thank everyone. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay. Same. Thank you, Rick. No, they, they say that uh, behind a uh, man's success is a woman, but it could also be the other way around. Behind the success of a woman is a man. So thank you for that. Exactly. Yes, yes thank you. And uh, so I would like also to thank, of course, Micah, Ananda, East West India, of course, Rick Nobel from the Netherlands Embassy, and Siki for, organ for helping organize this webinar. Big thanks to our participants for making the time to join us tonight, and we hope to see you in the succeeding sessions of this webinar series. And again, also many thanks to our esteemed panelists. Thank you and uh, good evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Good evening. Bye. So we are still here.